Well, I'm back. This is video two of our series uh, for the week four. This is chapter four of Criminology, third edition by Frank Smalliger. The topic, as we said, is biosocial and contemporary issues of crime. So we're continuing through. In a previous video, we discussed the chapter objectives, which are listed in the front of your chapter. Uh, the Human Genome Project, hopefully you watched the two videos that I instructed you to watch before moving on to this one, and you have a decent understanding of, of that and how it might uh, impact future policy and our understanding of, of crime and behavior in general. And also genetics and heritability were all what we discussed in the previous video. So now we wanna move on to the topics of brain dysfunction, how an injury or maybe a medical issue like a tumor, the impact of alcohol or drugs or some other chemical, uh, impacting the function of the brain and how that impact within various areas of the brain can then affect a behavior and how it, whether it's going to be something there where it is uncontrollable by the person as we go back to to the positivists and the idea of hard determinism are we going to look at somebody who has a brain dysfunction say say something wrong with the prefrontal cortex of their brain that causes them to be uh, uninhibited in their behavior are we then going to not hold them responsible for their behavior those are going to be some tough questions that we're going to have to address in the coming years and decades as the science gives us more and more information. We're also gonna look at body chemistry. You know, what's the impact of various uh, things going into the body? You know, the, your, your diet, the food that you eat, or the lack of food. You know, we, we talked last night in the classroom about, you know, that you look at some of our, our inner cities, people in poverty, who later on we're gonna talk about social structure and social process and how those things impact potentially impact behavior, you know, living in a really poor neighborhood, uh, crime all around, gunshots at night, you know, the stress of that. And we just talked about stress in the last section. But we're going to talk about diet. And think about it. If, if folks are poor or living in poverty, can they afford to have really healthy foods? And that's something that's that's been an issue that some folks are trying to address with, you know, neighborhood gardens and that kind of thing because it's really hard in some inner city neighborhoods to get fresh produce. Because in some places, you know, the, the, uh, the grocery stores, the supermarkets that you might find in the suburbs don't exist. You know, you have little markets, but they can't get all the same types of things. And you also have the issue, and maybe the soda tax in Philadelphia is going to help with this issue, where people are eating, you know, drinking sugary foods, too much of it. We're going to talk about that, you know, hyperglycemia, the, the impact of a lot of sugar. So diet's going to be important, and, and any kind, anything that changes the chemistry of your body. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, there was a video that was kind of viral on, on Facebook and other social media over the past week about a young woman who uh, went to a comedy club here in Philadelphia and apparently was asked to leave because she was being disruptive, and then outside she refused to, to leave because she wanted her money back for the show that she paid for that she's not getting to see the whole thing. And she was going off berating a police officer that was out there and all kinds of things. And now she's saying she, she knows there was some kind of thing going on, but she doesn't remember what it was. And she thinks that maybe, maybe she was drugged by someone. And I, I believe from what I could gather in the video, she was there for, with her boyfriend. So I don't know who would have drugged him, drugged her. But, you know, as the story plays out, apparently she was a couple other places and had a few drinks before she got there although she claims that she wasn't drunk. I mean, she, she knows her limits and all that kind of thing, which every drunk I ever locked up knew their limits too. They always said they only had two drinks and they didn't, they didn't know that it affected their behavior. But that's an impact. You know, this, if this woman had, in fact, you know, had too much to drink and she was drunk, didn't realize what she was doing, or did somebody actually drop something into her drink? You know, that's something that, that people are going to need to look at because she has since she was arrested because of her behavior. She actually spit on somebody, so she was arrested for assault. But she was also fired from her job as a result of the video that went out. Uh, but if, you know, is she totally responsible for her behavior? And she made, obviously, if she drank, she made the choice to drink. She admitted that. 
but what else was going on? So we want to look at that. You know, what kind of, how are things that go into your body, how do they impact and make changes? We'll look at, at the gender, what we call the gender ratio problem. And a basic, simple, simple uh, way to look at that is the fact that there's so many more men committing crimes than women. You know, why is that? Uh, someone suggested last night that it was, had more to do with the way we raise them than with any other factor. But who knows? There, are gene- there may be genetic factors that are, are inherited from uh, female to female. You know, uh, obviously we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the body chemistry. Again, we're going to talk about hormones, you know, whether it's uh, testosterone, which is more prevalent in males and females versus estrogen, which is more f- prevalent in females and males. You know, what does that have to do with behavior and aggressiveness? There are some studies that we're going to see that suggest that uh, if you have the violent females tend to have more testosterone in them than your average female. So we look at that and we'll look at other biosocial issues and how, how basically the interaction of what's going on in the body and what's going on in the environment coupled together, possibly, you know, create the situation to go back briefly to one, the one I was just mentioning. You look at, you look at folks in, in inner, you know, so-called bad neighborhoods in the inner city where you have, you know, maybe some households growing up without a father figure. So you don't have the male role model. You have crime all over the place. You have graffiti all over the place. You have poverty. The family's not making a lot of money. Maybe in some cases, even the, 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 the mother is out working. So sometimes the kids are unsupervised. Uh, we have issues with the schools. You know, there's this whole litany of things. And if the diet isn't right, if they live in an area that they're near or something where there's fumes going on, you got all these different things impacting and kind of makes it like ground zero for crime. And is that the reason why those particular areas of our inner cities are so infested with crime? Because all those things came together in one place. So we're going to look at some of those things and think about it. And during the, the, the whole the whole course, we're going to see other potentially thing, potential things that contribute to crime. But if those things are all those potential contributors are all occurring in one place, what does that tell us? And what does it tell us from a policy standpoint that we need to do? Uh, try to control for each of them, which is very difficult. So let's press on. Let's uh, take a look at, at the, uh, the slideshow so we can all be on the same page. Take me a little less time to do this than it did last time. So our first learning objective in, in this video is to talk about brain dysfunction. Hopefully you've already observed or watched the, the videos that I posted in last week's lecture series. Uh, the because uh, I did post a, uh, a playlist, the YouTube playlist that I posted that has the videos with the interviews with Adrian Rain, who is a professor of psychiatry and criminology at, at the University of Pennsylvania right here in Philadelphia. And he, he wrote the book that I, I showed you last week, Anatomy of Violence, The uh, Biological Roots of Crime. And some of his work gets into the root of the potential brain dysfunction. And I will, after this particular video, post a a video of a lecture that he did before a group, I don't know, the doctors or other types of scientists. But there's some very interesting things in that particular video. The the audio is not real good, so you're gonna have to turn your volume up really loud for that one, or maybe put some earphones in, make sure there's not some disruption going on in the room. But the content is is great. And there's also a, a, case study in that particular video towards the last like the last three quarters of the video about a guy named Michael who had what they called an orbital frontal tumor and based the basic story and you'll see there's an interview with him and his wife and it's very interesting so I, I encourage you very strongly to watch it it'll help you better understand this type this particular part of the course but basically what happened to him is he seemed to be a, a perfectly normal guy then all of a sudden, he started uh, committing sex offenses. He was molesting his his um, stepdaughter, uh, you know, going in and joining her in her bed when the mother wasn't home. And he eventually had the option of, you know, he was found out about it and he was charged, and he, he had the option of going to treatment or going to prison. He opted to go to treatment. He then attempted to uh, incur get sex from the people in the treatment facility. So he was expelled from the treatment facility, wound up with the option of going to prison, uh, but he had some issues and he had to go to a hospital and he wound up getting an MRI and they discovered his tumor. 
ultimately the treatment for the tumor, to remove the tumor, and his behavior returned to normal. And he was no longer, you know, preying on people for sex. So at some point, he, he's back living it at home and back in a normal environment, and he starts going after people for sex again. And it turned out that he had a recurrence of this tumor. And the big question is, should we be holding this guy, Michael, responsible uh, because the tumor had a significant impact on his behavior? And the bottom line, the video suggests that he actually, from his interview, he actually knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew what he was doing, he knew what was wrong, which is the basic of the McNaughton rule. If you've already had introduction to criminal justice, you should be familiar with the McNaughton rule. We're going to be looking at it in a few weeks, which is just one of the, the ways that states determine whether someone is, is legally insane or not, as far as whether they're responsible for their actions, you know, their criminal act. And this guy basically did know. So he should be held responsible or accountable. But going forward, if a person with this brain dysfunction is more likely to commit a crime than someone who doesn't have it, should we hold them both to the same level of responsibility? That's a key question that we're going to have to be looking at in the future. So what about this brain dysfunction thing? All right. As I said, Adrian Rain studies this a lot. It's in the book. I strongly recommend you read the book because it's awesome. It's excellent. And he covers all kinds of other criminological stuff in there. But one of the areas that he studies is the prefrontal cortex. And we look at the prefrontal cortex, and we have dysfunctions, and we have to look at how those individuals who have that condition interact with what's going on in the environment, including social and psychological influences. In Rain's book, he talks about a couple of guys who had some issues, and not Michael, but some other gentlemen, who one guy who had a basically a railroad spike, and this is in the 1800s, a railroad spike, a guy named Phineas Gage, if you want to look him up, go through his, his, his forehead, and it damaged his prefrontal cortex, but he survived. But he changed, his behavior changed dramatically from an upstanding, you know, good husband to winding up separating or divorcing from his wife, being a womanizer, a drunk, and what have you, all after this accident. And in, in the book, Rain surmises that it was the, the, the fact that the prefrontal cortex was damaged and he no longer had the inhibitions to stop or control his behavior. And he also didn't have a social support system that prevented it. And then there's another guy he talks about in a book whose, whose name I don't recall, but he was over in England. And he basically attempted to kill himself with a, a firearm to his head. Went through the prefrontal cortex. He survived. and the difference there is his behavior, he didn't turn into a drunk, a criminal, a womanizer, or whatever, but some of the significant features were the social environment was that he had a caring family that supported him and watched out for him and made sure that, that bad things didn't happen to him. And some of you may, may understand that if you have anybody in your family who has uh, you know, some type of mental handicap, physical handicap, we're looking out for them. We're providing support when they need it. You know, they, we, they obviously want their independence, but we provide them support. Imagine if that person in your family or maybe someone that you know, if not in your family, didn't have that support, uh, what would happen to them? So that's the difference here between Phineas Gage and this gentleman from London was that the one guy had no support and wound up his behavior changing drastically. The other guy had support and not so much of a change. So we have to basically look at the dysfunction in the brain in relationship with the interaction with the environment. Uh, the science of neurocriminology is looking at the neuro neurological links between the organism, social factors, and criminal behavior. So, you know, what's going on in the brain and the nervous system? How does that interaction with social factors in the environment and other things going on lead or not lead to criminal behavior. That's the study of neurocriminology is, is looking at the impact of what's going on in the brain and the interaction with the social environment. The frontal brain hypothesis is when you're basically referencing physical changes to certain parts of the brain to explain criminality. And if you watch the, the video that I'm going to post after this one, uh, 
Professor Rain gets into the prefrontal cortex and damage the prefrontal cortex. He also gets into an area of the brain called the amygdala. And there's another area of a brain that he studies that in some people doesn't uh, form properly, that studies have shown that those people are more relevant more likely to have behavior issues. And he gets into all that. He also gets into the, the, the science and he gets into some of the statistical stuff, which I would look for, you know, don't, don't turn off the video when he starts talking about some of the statistics because he doesn't spend a lot of time doing that. But look at, you know, the, the general statements he's making. And also in this video, there, he's also talking about the dietary issues that we're going to address shortly and low heart rate issues we're going to address shortly so it's the video is very good it covers a lot of the sec a lot of the stuff that's in this section neuroplasticity it's an interesting concept is the ability of the brain to alter its structure and function in response to experience now we talked about this a little bit in a previous video you know someone who whether it's law enforcement fire service military you know they experience a lot of different things and their brain changes their act their behavior changes they change and it's also uh, probably one of the premises of some of the psychiatric treatment or psychological uh, counseling is that the brain can change. We have that ability. Uh, severe stresses. Again, go back to, you know, you got the inner city kid who, who every night they hear like gunshots all night long. They're going to change and they're going to behave differently possibly in the future than someone who lives in an environment where they don't have that going on. Some suggest that the interplay between heredity, biology, and social and physical environments may be much more complicated than once thought, but may be a, the key nexus in any consideration of crime causation. Well, what does that mean? It basically means what we're saying is you have a whole lot of different factors. You know, what came up? What's in your DNA? What's in your brain? Your biology? What illnesses do you have? Do you have a tumor in the brain that's, that's impacting the prefrontal cortex? What, what, where do you live? Do you live in, 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 a, in a nasty section of North Philly? Are you living in Kensington right next to where, you know, that, that area where, where all the, uh, the opioid issues going on? Do you live out in Villanova in a nice neighborhood? Do you live in the suburbs of Jersey? Are you living in Camden City? You know, where are you? That's that social environment. And even, even in the neighborhoods, you know, people have various issues going on and you could have people living in a, in a bad neighborhood, but have a very strong supportive family. Whereas you might have someone who's living in a, in a really nice neighborhood that is being beat every day. So even within neighborhoods, you have different social engagement. But the issue is, is all of these things interplay with each other and interact with each other and ultimately could lead to, to various types of behavior like crime. Next section is body chemistry theories. This is where we're gonna look at your diet, blood sugar levels, environmental contaminants, hormones, you know, how do those things explain crime? There have been studies done in, in prisons with prisoners by changing their diets, and I believe your book gets into that, and seeing that depending upon a diet, you have different behavior amongst the inmates. So that said, how do we make sure that people are getting the proper diet, that they're not gonna have the issues that lead them to, to be more aggressive and more violent. You know, how do we make sure that, that the kid going into high school is not drinking a gallon of Coke before he comes into class and he's you know, got a sugar high and he's really, you, know, you can't control him. Uh, one of our students last night talked about a child that was in a, uh, a, a young child in a program that she was working in and that child would have this gigantic sugary donut before they came into into the school and they were out of control so there's some you know anecdotal issues and, and some of us know those of you that had kids might know or you know, nephews nieces whatever that you get these kids eating a lot of sugar and you know they're all rambunctious more aggressive so if someone has a high sugary diet does it then cause changes in their body over time so we're going to look at some of those things uh, again, blood sugar levels, environmental contaminants, hormones. So the sugar issue, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. Big words, medical terms. Hypo means low, hyper means high. Simple as that. If you're hypoglycemia, it means you have low sugar levels in your body. 
if you have hyperglycemia, you got higher sugar levels. So one of the first studies to focus on chemical imbalances in the body actually found a link between hypoglycemia, low sugar levels, and people that committed murder. And then there's other more recent studies that linked high sugar levels to crime. So wait, you look at that one and say, okay, so I can't have too much sugar, I can't have too little sugar, so what's the exact right amount that I should have in my diet? Should I not have that half gallon of ice cream before I go to bed at night? Should I not eat the three Hershey bars and drink the 17 Cokes during the day? Uh, of course, it's the Cokes with the sugar, not to mention the sugar, but what about the caffeine, which is another issue. You know, somebody who's drinking a whole lot of caffeine during the day who's all hopped up and, and jittery and nervous and whatnot, that's a whole nother chemical issue in the body. Variation in blood sugar are in, linked to impaired ability of the brain to reason effectively and judge long-term behavior. So the idea there is someone with sugar level issues can't make good judgments. Maybe they can't make good decisions. Of course, then you fall back on again, if somebody comes in and, and suggests that, well, I did it because of the sugar, the sugar made me do it. As in, if you, if you look up the, uh, the murder of Harvey Milk, who was a mayor of San Francisco many years ago, the guy who killed him allegedly claimed that he was on a sugar high, and it, it's been termed the Twinkie defense. Uh, there's one story I read about that suggested that he never ate Twinkies, but for some reason, it got that name. But it's mentioned in your book. If you do a little research on the Twinkie defense or Harvey Milk, you'll probably come across it. Uh, but the basic premise is there are studies that show that there could be links between sugar, whether it's too high or too low, and people's ability to, to judge and reason, make good decisions. Some studies have suggested that certain food additives change behavior, which is why, you know, one thing besides the health issues and you know whether it's cancer causing issues or whatever you know there's there's some studies that suggest that some of the additives that, that you have in your food may cause uh, behavioral issues and wonder about it. if you're wondering about it just just look at any any food that you might have available to you so and see all the different things in it and you might wonder well what is that so like say i, I look at a stick of gum that i have here and it says uh Wow, it's interesting. It says produced with genetic engineering. It says made of sugar, gum base, corn syrup, less uh, natural flavors, less than 2% of glycerol, soy lecithin, color added, acesulfame K, hydroxy something lecithin, asperitame, which is a sweetener, uh, phenylketoronics. So there's all kinds of stuff in here that I can't even pronounce, let alone tell you what it does. And that's just in a stick of gum. So there's, and there's additives, unless, unless you're one of those people who's, who's buying it at like Whole Foods or something like that, pretty much a lot of the foods that we get have all kinds of additives. And even go back to the sugar issues. If you're buying from the local grocery store and you're getting this, you know, the bag of chips, maybe too much sugar, too much salt, not only is it going to make you maybe a little bit too large in the belly or your hips or your butt or whatever, but maybe it's going to affect the brain as well. So it's something that we, that we really got to look at. There's other studies that also show that people that are having, that don't have uh, sufficient vitamins in their diet. In other words, their diet is deficient in vitamins. With deficient means they don't have enough. They don't have the right vitamins and other nutrients can also increase aggressiveness and agitation open a door to crime. So again, we look at, you know, we look at families that don't have sufficient money to put the right food on the table, or we look at people that are not making good diet, dietetic choices. Not only are they affecting their, their long-term health, but maybe they're affecting their brain and their uh, status as a criminal as well, or their behavior. Environmental pollution. There are studies that suggest that substances that are in our environment, you know, whether you're living next to a dump, or on top of a dump, or you're living next to a chemical plant that is spewing some types of fumes. You know, maybe there's smoke, maybe there's fumes from various chemicals, and periodically they have leaks. Uh, maybe even, you know, a nuclear plant. 
all these things in our environment we somehow get exposed to what if you know there was a, a scare last night in in, uh, in Trenton because there was an issue with the water and they were telling people not to drink the water at all because of the issue I, I didn't really find out exactly what the issue was with it but they're basically telling people not to drink the water you, you look at Flint Michigan where there was a significant amount of lead in the water, which then led to, to illnesses within the children. But it also, heavy metals and other toxins affect the brain. And the suggestion in the, in the science and the research is that they lose their natural restraint that holds their violent tendencies in check. It sounds almost like the same thing when you have that brain injury to the prefrontal cortex, but here it's being caused by, by the, the intake of these chemicals into our body. There's other studies so focusing on prenatal substance exposure. Prenatal means you know when when a woman's pregnant and she's carrying a baby inside of her, that's the prenatal environment. And if if this person is is drinking heavily, uh, using drugs, smoking, has a poor diet, you know there's studies that are telling us that you're going to have disorders. And some of them are very obvious. If you have, look up the you know fetal alcohol syndrome where you have babies that come out deformed, you have uh, babies with, with significant brain problems because of what the mom was doing uh, during the pregnancy stage. So there are studies that suggest that, that those things, it's very important that mothers who want to have healthy children have to be very conscious of their diet and everything else that they're putting in their bodies. Psychobiotics. It's a study of psychological and behavioral effects that bacteria, usually those found in your gut, can have on mind, feelings, emotions, and behavior. So here there's people that are studying things that are growing within our body, you know, because there's bacteria in our body, there's all kinds of things. And like those of you that are on a, eat yogurt to help you digest your food, I mean, yogurt's full of bacteria. Well, there's some bacteria that apparently has bad effects on our behavior. So you know, maybe if I eat too much yogurt or I eat the wrong kind of yogurt or somehow I, I eat something that's got mold on it or whatever, and these things continue to grow within my body, science is showing that that could also impact our mind, feelings, emotions, and behaviors. Heart rate. Uh, heart rate, Adrian Rain talks about this, is uh, low resting heart rate has been shown to be an indicator of potential criminal. Now, we, we can't get too confused on this because every person has a low resting heart rate isn't necessarily gonna be the bank robber. Because think of our, our well-tuned athletes. Many of them are gonna have a low resting heart rate because of their conditioning. So it's, it's, it's a science that says there are indicators that these people with low resting heart rates are more likely to be involved in crime but understand that doesn't mean everybody. It's just like when last week when we were looking at the constitutional issues and the body types, the mesomorph that we were talking about, that person who's in good physical condition. Is a person in good physical condition, does that necessarily mean that they're gonna be strong arm robbing people on the street? No. I think what we said last week is basically it means that they have the tools that they're more capable of doing these types of crimes. So a person with a low resting heart rate is more likely to be in better physical condition. Whereas if they get into a physical fight with somebody or they're attacking someone or they're running someone down on the street, you know, their heart is not gonna race as much as say mine would. You know, me just walking down a block, I'm gonna have a heart rate of 110. Whereas, you know, somebody with a low resting heart rate who's maybe in the 50s, they're walking down a block, they're lucky if it breaks 60. And it's like, nothing's going on. It's like, try walking around a block in your house. Those of you that are in good shape, you'll be able to breathe, you'll be able to talk, you'll have no problems. If you count your heart rate, and you can do it the old fashioned way with a stopwatch or your, your wristwatch and count, you'll notice that some of us, some of you will jack up. I use a Fitbit to count my heart rate. And my general, my heart rates are usually around 78, which is not a low resting heart rate, but it's, my doctor doesn't mind it. But low resting heart rate is people that, that are down about in the 40s, 50s, you know, low 60s, and there is a clear, a clear uh, relationship with criminality. The interesting thing is it's, it's related to males, but not females. 
But again, you're going to find it in, in well-conditioned athletes as well. And there's nobody out there that's saying that athletic conditioning plays a role in crime causation. So there's nobody suggesting that if you go to the gym and you work out regularly and you bring your heart rate down, that you're causing crime. It's just that there is a clear linkage between that low resting heart rate and crime. So again, you go to the issue is, well, what's the difference between this guy with a low resting heart rate and this guy over here with a low resting heart rate? This guy became a football star and this guy became a bank robber and he's in prison. There's got to be something else going on, right? And that's, that's what this is all about. So hormones and criminality. There's been a lot of, of discussion with regard to hormones, testosterone being the, the biggest one that they're concerned about. You know, that's the primary male hormones hormone, been linked to aggression, an important role in increasing the propensity toward violence and aggression among men. In other words, people with higher testosterone levels have been shown to be more likely uh, to be involved in crime. Women, on the other hand, their bodies manufacture about one-tenth of the amount of testosterone as men do as men do and yeah we don't see a lot of female criminals relatively if we compare them to men but we do see relatively high levels of testosterone in women that are involved in aggressively dominant behavior so we may say that high level of testosterone in, in the female criminal a violent criminal maybe in someone who's in you know maybe a female firefighter or police officer or somebody who's in it a more dominant profession? Some, yes, some, no. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's actually done a study of people in those professions or, or maybe female athletes, but it's out there. Testosterone has been linked to aggression, more so in males than females, but females who have been involved in invested, aggressive dominant behavior has, have seemed to have more testosterone than your average female. Premenstrual syndrome, syndrome, Hopefully everybody knows what that is. Uh, time in a, in a woman's life during the month, you know, before their menstrual period, which studies are seeing irritable, aggressive, and confused behavior, loss of self-control, possibly explained by uh, drops in serotonin. So as a result of whatever's going on in that female body during that time frame, there's a drop in serotonin, serotonin, which is a behavior regulating chemical. Uh, there's all kinds of studies suggest that anything that drops serotonin then has a link to aggressive behavior. So this particular subject right now, PMS, there have been studies that shown that there is a, a drop in serotonin levels, which could be the cause of that uh, irritability or aggressive behavior that occurs during that period of time. And it's, it's different with, with different people. And granted, there are a lot of medications today to deal with those issues so that, you know, people can function. But there's some that have uh, more severe symptoms than others. So it's not like you can say it's across the board, again, for everybody. Next section. We're going to look at biosocial theories and the role of gender ratio problem in contemporary criminology. Also, we're going to look at you know the biosocial, which is basically the interaction of various factors. So, biosocial criminology is a theoretical perspective that sees the interaction between biology and the physical and social environments as a key to understanding human behavior, including criminality. So that's been really the underlying premise of everything that we've talked about so far. Is we have biology. We have what's in your genes, what's in your DNA, what's going on in your brain, what chemicals have you put in your body that are making changes to your body, you know, what's going on there? And then what's that interaction with the physical and social environment that you may live in or you work in? Or, you know, the person, you're sitting on a train on the way home and you've had a bad day and you got somebody who's, who's being loud and obnoxious. You know, when, if you hadn't had a bad day or maybe... You know, there's something else going on. Maybe you wouldn't pop off on that person. You know, all kinds of things interact to create our behavior. Walsh studied and, and 
observed that biosocial perspectives and theories of criminality are theories of criminality, not crime. So basically it's telling us why someone might have criminal uh, behavior or criminality in general, where crime is the label that's placed on specific behaviors that violate criminal law. Fine line between the two, but the crime is, is the actual act of, of breaking the law where criminality is maybe the, the behavior, say it's a property of individuals, continuous trait that is an amalgamum of other continuous traits and belongs to a more inclusive kind of criminality. So we're talking criminology. So we're talking about a combination of all these various traits, which creates a pattern of behavior, if you will, where a crime is whatever that specific crime is. Biological criminology attempts to recognize the complexity of the relationship between the biology, behavior, and social environment by looking at the multitude of factors leading to criminality. I kind of feel like beating a dead horse here. We're talking about all these different things combined are leading to criminality. And what we really want to do with the biological, biosocial criminology, crimin criminology is try to identify those things that are more likely to lead to crime with the influence of other factors and do what we can to control those factors so that that doesn't happen. Which factors are we gonna control? We're we gonna control the bio, biological factors, like removing the tumor and then making sure that that tumor doesn't come back, come back? Or are we gonna figure out what's the, what's the other issue? Why is it that a particular person behaves a certain way when they are uh, uninhibited? Why did Michael, who you're gonna watch in the video following this, why did he sexually assault his, his uh, stepdaughter when he was uninhibited? I mean, is that a normal thing? If someone's drunk or under the influence of something else that, that affects their prefrontal frontal cortex, are they apt to do that? No. What we discussed last night is, is, you know, we all have things that, think about it. There's probably some time in your life where you want to do something and you said, no, that would be wrong, or no, that would be illegal, or no, that would be immoral, or whatever. So you had that break that stopped you from doing it. So these people that have the problem with the prefrontal cortex, they may have that same underlying desire to do something that you were able to say, no, I can't do that because it's wrong, but they can't or they have great difficulty, even though they know it's wrong, like Michael, as you're gonna see in the next video, they have great difficulty stopping themselves from doing it. So this is the one slide I told you about with all the different bubbles on it, and you look, combination of factors, you know, could we have one person that has all these factors going on? You know, it's like a, uh, a mix that creates a criminal. Uh, you look, you have prenatal substance exposure, including controlled substances, poor diet, nutrition, body chemistry issues, hormones, blood sugar, uh, their genetic makeup, the body type, like we talked about last, last week, their gender, environmental toxins and pollution, their age, intelligence, personality, uh, evidence or lack thereof of brain dysfunction, dysfunction, the weather, you know, all these different factors could come together and then create the criminal behavior that we've been talking about all through this. And not like you're going to find somebody that has every single one of these issues going on, but it could be that a combination of, of one or two of them together results in criminality. Gender differences. So the beginning of this section talked about the gender ratio problem. But we know that with few exceptions, the number of crimes committed by men far exceeds the number of crimes committed by women. And when women do commit crimes, they're, more, they're far more likely to assume the role of followers than leaders. So if you look at, say, a violent crime, a group of people, generally the females are not the leaders. Well, that's not always true. We have a, a, a video, couple of videos we're going to show when we talk about uh, some of the social issues, which are about two females, one of which is the leader of her gang. And there's males and females in her gang, and she's the boss. So this is not always true. 
that the women are the followers. So you're going to have some women that are the, that are the leaders, no doubt. I mean, even, and look in non-criminal activities, you know, you have throughout the country right now, you have a whole lot of female police chiefs in what is generally considered a very aggressive profession. You have uh, female leaders in the military. So this is not always true, but with regard to criminality, what we see is many, many more men involved in crime. Now, some people, when we talk about social issues later on, that say, well, some of that is because we treat women differently and we're not as ready to arrest and charge and you know, prosecute and convict women as we are men. That's a debate we can have later on in the course. We're gonna, we will be talking about that. The gender ratio problem is we need, to, we need to find an explanation. What is the explanation for that difference? Why do more men commit crime than women? And I think some people would say, if we can figure out what's going on with women that they commit less crimes, that maybe we can figure out a way to get the men to commit less crimes. And that's one way of looking at it. Is there a biological aspect? Is there something in, in genetics? Is there something in the way that we raise girls with, as opposed to how we raise boys that make boys more aggressive? And Adrian Rain, in one of the videos that I had you watch last week, talked about one of those environment issues, environmental issues that, you know, traditionally we might have given boys toy guns and we give girls dolls. And, you know, we, we basically socialize girls to be mothers where we socialize boys to be aggressive and be out in the world. So is it a social issue? Or is there some biological issue that's different between males and females? The other thing is, is sexual selection. You know, there, there's a whole host of studies out there that suggest that, that males are more aggressive in all species, not just, not just humans, in all species, because they're trying to select the, the appropriate female to breed with. And you've probably seen videos if you watch Animal Planet or you've watched, you know, Lion Kingdom or whatever that show used to be on, where you would see videos of, of males fighting, whether it's a rhinoceros or lions fighting over the female that they are going to later breed with. So it's suggested that this is also in human society and males tend to be more aggressive because they want to breed. Evolutionary perspective is another theoretical approach that seeks to explain behavior with reference to human evolutionary history. In other words, how have we evolved or changed from the beginning of time up to now? And we also recognize that influence that genes have over human traits. Now, some of that science is suggesting that there's changes in genes over the years. Now, if you do it from a historical perspective, you see that, that in certain cases, our behavior is different. Or if you look at it, it maybe a little science fiction, there's a movie called Demolition Man, where uh, when society in, I think it was the year 3030 or some, some, something like that, everybody was really, really passive. Now, was that a, a genetic change that occurred over time? You know, even the police officers, they didn't carry guns. There wasn't violent crime in the society. And the police actually had this electric, electric device was kind of like a stun gun, but I don't think it had the same power. And that was their whole tool. And there was this machine that if you cursed, you got a ticket. Society totally changed. And that was, seemed to be from the way the movie was, was shown as an evolutionary thing. So there are definite changes. You know, do men now, as you might've seen in caveman days, you know, go grab a woman by the hair and, and drag her off into his cave so they could breed? No that would be considered rape in our society today. You know, what about the evolution of, of most places in our society, you know, a, a, an adult male having sex with a 14 year old in order to create babies is, is bad. Uh, of course, there's some cultures where it's still okay. Uh, if you followed the Kaplan trial recently, where you had this, this guy who had uh, nine young girls gifted to him, uh, the youngest of which is now 19, but this occurred 10 years ago. So the girl was like, like eight or nine. And he actually had two babies with this woman, this young girl. You know, we consider that sick and depraved today, but in a, in a past society, that was okay. 
So we see that, that there are changes in evolution, and some of those could be biological changes that occur that make us different. All right, that's the end of this particular segment. And we just finished discussing brain dysfunction, uh, body chemistry, and the impact of the various chemicals and foods and nutrients and whatever to go into our body, uh, gender roles and gender gender ratio and the interaction. Remember, it's a lot of it's about the interaction. You know, if, if I eat a dozen Twinkies today, I'm not going to go off and kill somebody. But maybe there's something else that happens in my life at the same time while I'm on this sugar high. You know, if I am drunk and stupid one night and I go out and drive and I kill somebody, you know, is it just the alcohol that created that? What was it? It's the interaction of everything that goes on in our lives, our biological makeup, our DNA, our genes, our, so, you know, our social environment that we live in, all those things interplay together and interact together to create our behavior. All right. So this concludes this section. As I said before, I'm going to post directly after this video, a video, a lecture video by Professor Adrian Rain. That video is 30 minutes long. And the, the audio is really bad, so you want to try to pay close attention. You may want to, you know, skip through some of the parts, but it's a really good overview of the material that we covered in this particular video, with regard to the the implications of what goes on in the brain. And he shows pictures of the brain that I don't have available to show. And at, towards the end of the video is is of that very interesting case study of Michael with the with the brain tuner tuner tumor that apparently helped him to be a sex offender. So watch that video after this one and I'll see you in a bit.